Hi, I'm Ed Allen. I'm the park historian, and today we're going to be talking about mining methods and mining techniques. When you find gold, mainly you're going to find gold in quartz. About 90% of the time all over the Earth's surface, gold is found in quartz. And so this rock has gold all over the face of it here. And the more you look at this rock, the more gold you see. So this is a very nice sample. The same with this one. There's gold right there, and then on the surface here, there's gold all over in small particles. Both of these rocks are marked interpretation, and they're found in the back room of the museum. Uh, these are rocks that you can handle, and you can have other people handle. These rocks have a value of about $850 for the two of them, so uh, you do need to keep an eye on them when they're being passed around. So. The question is, how do we get this gold out of these rocks? So how are we going to get that gold out of those quartz rocks? With this. This is a two-stamp stamp mill. What this does is it's going to crush that gold in the rocks. It'll crush that to a very fine particle size using these 600-pound weights. Now, the way this thing works is we've got an electric motor that drives that big uh, pulley up there and the cam is attached to that. So as, the, as that pulley turns, the cams lift the tappets, which in turn lift the stamps. This big stem here, and it's got a big head. We'll look at that in a minute. The stamps will crush it to a particle size small enough to go through a 40 mesh screen. Now the screen over there that you see is 18 mesh. That's window screen. 40 mesh means 40 linear holes per inch. 40 holes this way, 40 holes that way, 1,600 holes per square inch. That's the particle size required to break the gold free from the host rock, the quartz. Now, of course, this is mixed with water, too. Um, we use 300 gallons of water for every ton of ore that we're going to crush. Now, what's a ton of ore look like? If I had a solid block of quartz in front of me here, a ton would be two feet wide, a foot thick, and two and a half feet tall. That's a one-ton car, and since quartz has the same specific gravity all over the world, they manufacture those cars for one ton, two ton, five ton. So, we're going to crush the gold to this very fine particle size, and when it gets to the point where it goes through the screen, it flows down this table right here. So when the crushed ore comes through the screen, it flows down this amalgamation table. And what this is, is this is a sheet of copper that's been painted with mercury. Mercury sticks to copper, and a lot of metals stick to mercury. Gold and silver uh, certainly do. So as when you'll paint this with mercury in the, in the uh, first of the day, and it'll be a flat sheet. It'll look like a mirror surface. And as it collects gold, any particle of gold that touches that mercury, the mercury will just pull it in and hang on to it. And as this occurs, the mercury starts to rise up. In fact, it starts looking lumpy, kind of like oatmeal. When it gets, when there's a lot of gold in there, you're going to stop the machine and you're going to scrape all of that off. That's called amalgam. You know, an alloy is two or more metals combined. Amalgam is mercury and other metals combined. So we'll scrape all of that off. It's kind of a semi-solid. You can actually form it up. We'll take that and put it into a retort oven. This is a sealed container. And what we're going to do is we're going to boil the mercury away from the gold. Mercury has a boiling point of 670 degrees. Gold doesn't even melt until 2,000 degrees. So we'll put it in this sealed container with a long exhaust tube on it. And we're going to see this in a little while um, in the other building. We'll heat the mercury to 670 degrees. It turns into a very deadly gas and goes down in a long exhaust tube that has a water jacket around it. When that hot gas touches that cold surface, it condenses the mercury. So the mercury runs out the end of the tube in a liquid form. And we're going to reuse it. Mercury is expensive. It was then and it is now. So using that process, we have gotten the gold out of our rocks. So 
now we're in front of the Mining Techniques building. And what this is, uh, this building and the one next to it, the Chinese store, were built by an American contractor and leased to Chinese merchants. This is the Manly Hardware store, and the other one is the Wahop uh, General Merchandise and uh, uh, Bank store. So this is the entrance to this building. So when you go in this, this entrance here, you start at the beginning of mining here in, in the area, in the foothills of the Sierras. So we start out with panning, one man with a pan. And what that pan is, could be an Indian basket, could be a batilla, a wood um, bowl uh, of Mexican origin, or it could be one of Sam Brannan's gold pans. So one man with a pan can go through about 50 pans of dirt a day. But there were a couple of guys here in California who had, had um, been to the gold rush in Dahlonega, Georgia, and they knew about rockers or cradles. And this is a two to three man operation and it speeds things up dramatically. Two men with a rocker can go through 300 pans of dirt in a day. Then the next step is more organization. You get more people together, you buy water from a ditch company, you put your long toms or sluice boxes down, and everybody shovels dirt frantically into the long toms while you buy water from the ditch company. And hopefully at the end of the day, it'll pan out for you. So let's go inside. So here we have Chinese um, miners working rockers in these pictures. And uh, that's a good portrayal of that. And then over here, we've got people working a sluice box. That's a very old picture, by the way, and you notice the woman's dress. That's an oddity to have a woman out there to begin with. So here's more sluice boxes um, and a lot of camp life here and so forth. So the next thing that they started doing was, was um, hard rock mining. They realized that the gold, a lot of the gold that they were finding had quartz with it. And so they, just, they figured we need to find the source of the gold. And um, when you did that, by the way, you're not a miner, you're a prospector. Okay? And once they found veins of gold in quartz up in the hills, that's when the hard rock era began. And that was probably right about 1850. The problem with hard rock mining is you need a lot of capitalization to begin to start a mine. You need to hire a lot of variously skilled people not only miners, but carpenters to uh, shore up uh, timber the mine, um, need mill hands to run a stamp mill, and of course you need a stamp mill also. So it was more for corporations to, to mine hard rock. So this little room is dedicated to hard rock mining, and this is a very, very dangerous uh, thing to do. Um, You're underground, you're at the, um, it's pitch dark, you've got one candle burning. Each man was given a certain number of candles each day for his shift. And, um, and you're down there with um, a single jack. A single jack, by the way, is a, is a hand drill and a hammer. So you're hitting and turning and hitting and turning to drill a hole into this solid rock, into this rock face. And later on, you're gonna use a longer drill and a longer drill uh, so you're going to drill this hole down about four feet. That's single jacking. Double jacking is where you have two men working one drill. One man is holding the drill and turning it while the other one hits it with a sledgehammer. That sledgehammer, if it misses, usually hits the guy right in the back of the head. So this is dangerous work, especially now you've only got two candles burning in there with two men in the, at the head of the shaft. Eventually, they went to um, better uh, drilling techniques. This is a... Uh, hydraulic drill that's air powered. The problem with an air powered drill is that it puts a lot of quartz dust into the air and quartz dust gets in your lungs and causes white lung. It literally cuts your lungs to shreds. And so they eventually started putting water through the drill to wet it. This actually uh, speeded up the process and it kept the dust way down. So that was a major improvement. And eventually they stopped using black powder and went to what they called giant powder, what we call dynamite. The problem with dynamite is that the, the um, fumes from dynamite will give you just a horrific headache. And so the way this worked was the miners would go down on their shift, 
they'd drill all of their holes, they'd put the explosives in the holes, they'd wire it all up so that the first charge went off right in the center, the next charges went out uh, a little further, about a foot away, and then about two feet away, another charge went off, and then finally the whole ex uh, the rim blew. And this was, you wouldn't even uh, hear a series of explosions. It would just be one bang to your ear. And as soon as they let that charge off, they leave for the day. They allow the mine to clear, the smoke to clear out of there for a while, and then the muckers go down. And the muckers are the ones who are actually going to put the gold bearing rock in the, the uh, ore cart and push it out of the mine. Well, hydraulic mining is basically nothing more than placer mining. Uh, you're, you're trying to extract the gold from gravels and sands in ancient riverbeds. And you can see these ancient riverbeds whenever you drive around here in the foothills of the Sierras, and you'll see road cuts and big gravel um, um, bands in the rocks. And so these pictures denote that. They're showing, uh, this is probably Malakoff Diggings, uh, which is a state park uh, to our north. And this water, this is a monitor, and it would shoot water out at such a high pressure that if you walked in front of this, it would just cut you in half. Okay? This is dangerous work. And of course, these hillsides are collapsing all the time. And when the water runs down the hill with all this gravel and, and dirt and gold in it, then it goes through a series of sluice boxes, and the gold is, uh, is um, um, captured in that manner. Oftentimes they put mercury in these sluice boxes, and that's another one of our mercury contamination problems, is because a lot of that mercury would escape. So they finally outlawed this in 1884, and the reason was that these hydraulic miners wouldn't keep their debris out of the creeks and rivers. They would build little dams to stop the debris from getting in the rivers, but it was never enough. And at times of high water, these little dams would be washed away and they would inundate farmers' fields to the point where the farmers could not grow a crop. And so because of that, the, uh, this went to court. Uh, the hydraulic miner, miners were sued by farmers. It went to court and in 1884, we got our first environmental laws in the United States stopping hydraulic mining. It didn't actually stop it. It just required that the hydraulic miners deal with the debris that they were, um, that they were causing. The hydraulic miners said, we are grandfathered in. We were here before the farmers. But the farmers said, well, what you're doing is incredibly destructive and you can only do it one time, whereas we farm year after year and you're destroying our ability to do that. So the court sided with the farmers and the hydraulic law of 1884 was uh, put in place. This is a model of a dredge. And th this is another form of placer mining. Uh, there were areas in here in California on the valley floor that um, old river courses and river courses that uh, present river courses had tremendous quantities of gold in them. And one of the ways to get that out was with this dredge. It's a, it has a plastic. So the buckets bring the gold bearing material up to the hopper. It's dumped into the hopper. And then the hopper pu uh, uh, puts it into the um, big concentrator here. This is a cylinder that's turning and it's got holes in it. So the small material will go through the holes, but the big material, the big rocks, They'll go out the back. They'll go up this conveyor and they'll be dumped behind it. Now the way this thing moves is it's in its own pond and it'll move back and forth like this, eating away the front and filling in the back. So when you drive down Highway 50 around Folsom, you'll see these huge piles of rocks down there. That's from dredging. And if you fly over that area, you'll see these snakes of material below you. And those dredges operated around Folsom until 1957. That gives you an idea as to how much gold they have down there. Uh, and this is only about 50% efficient. If you had a piece of gold this big, it's not going through these sluice boxes here. It's going out the back. 
And that's why you see people roll with uh, metal detectors down there because there's still 50% of the gold still there. This is a model of a Chinese pump. The miners felt that the middle of the river, the very bottom of it, would be full of gold. They're finding it on the banks, should be in the, in the middle. And so they built these Chinese pumps to literally pump the water out of the river completely so they could go down and find this gold at the very bottom of the river. And what they didn't know was the river will continue to push gold along the bottom. It deposits gold in the bends of the river where the current slows. And unfortunately, these guys spent a lot of time and money building these pumps, putting the river in a flume along the uh, other side of the hill. And, um, and then just to find out that there's very little gold in the middle of the river. So this was an exercise in futility. But the people that lived around here could hear these pumps squeaking and moaning all night long. This was 24-7. Uh, 